Our next speaker is Chris Mountford, who is a full-time software developer for Atlassian Software. If you don't know who Atlassian is, they provide uh, a number of really exciting uh, software project products for developers and content creators. And just as a little plug, I can say that I used uh, Atlassian Source Tree Git management, code repository management software to write the uh, book I wrote. So the entire book was written with their software. Really nice. A uh, piece of software, a great company, but um, Chris has a much longer history in software. We were just reminiscing about uh, seeing the historical development of the internet from the inside, and he was once at CompuServe trying to persuade the big wigs that this internet would steamroll them. Um, and of course, as all of us who were involved in those kinds of discussions, failing. Because um, you can't tell someone the truth when their paycheck depends on not knowing it. Uh, just like Jeffrey Tucker tells economists now to pay attention to Bitcoin, and uh, for the most part, he fails too because they can't overcome their training. Uh, Chris has been on this uh, journey for decades. He's seen this type of revolution happen in technology. This is the first time we're bringing it to economics. And what a better person could we have to tell us a bit about Bitcoin basics? Uh, we're going to have three sessions in a row talking about Bitcoin basics, about mining, and about exchanges before our lunch break, which will be at 12:30 uh, downstairs. And uh, so let's kick it off. Please welcome Chris Mountford. Hello everyone. I'm uh, I'm honoured to be introduced by Andreas, and I think I might be wearing my Andreas underpants. Many of you probably are. <laughs> Big fan. <laughs> Only joking. That would be creepy. Uh, first thing I want to say is I'm also honoured to be in such a wonderful country. Not just the geography, uh, and not just the people, but also I think New Zealand stands out for me for a number of reasons in uh, in a sort of technical political sphere. And I want to congratulate you for having taken a position on software patents, which uh, rules them out as a ridiculous nonsense. So thanks very much from, uh, from a software guy uh, for, that, for taking that stand. Uh. So I wanted to cover what is Bitcoin, uh, and I, just, I think I should take a pulse. Uh, let's, let's say everyone put up their hand and uh, make it like a, like a fuel gauge. So when uh, you are uh, completely new to Bitcoin, you put your hand like this, empty. I don't know anything about Bitcoin at all. Uh, and you can go all the way up through, I, I'm pretty confident with the, the fundamentals and you know, I could explain it to people, all the way over to uh, maybe uh, Andreas level here. So let's do that now. Everyone stick their hand up and find yourself on that gauge. And I'll just be able to use this. All right, a lot of verticals, that's good. A few Andreases, and, uh, and so that makes it easy for me, right. So I wanted to break it into these three components. I think these really are, um, you have to simplify when you, when you start to explain things, but Bitcoin is a digital currency. Uh, it's certainly intended to be, it's in the Satoshi paper, it's been defined that way. Uh, but it's not just that, uh, it's also a payment network. Uh, and I think one of the most exciting things about it is also that it's a general purpose technology. It isn't just uh, financial technology, it has a much broader application, uh, as, if a, a, as if finance wasn't broad enough. Another thing to remember is that Bitcoin is really just a five-year-old. Uh, it can be volatile, and uh, it's, it's young, it can be hard to manage, and, and actually you really need to uh, get your hands dirty uh, when you deal with it, because uh, it isn't all well-appointed and uh, uh, and tucked in, the user interfaces are a little rough, things like that. Uh, so that's one thing to remember. And while I'm at the broad strokes, Bitcoin is not uh, a company, it's not a product, it's not backed by a government, it's not asset backed, whatever that might mean. Uh, it doesn't derive its value from some other price of an asset. And it's no, there's no service you need to sign up for. So it's a digital currency, that's number one. Now, when I talk about Bitcoin, the currency, I often like to blur the boundaries between Bitcoin as a digital currency and the very many altcoins that there are. Uh, sometimes I'm talking about Bitcoin 
specifically, uh, not these other altcoins. And other times what I'm saying is equally applicable uh, to all of them. So what you can think of Bitcoin as is like digital gold. Uh, it is uh, like gold in many ways. And these are the ways that I would say it's most like gold. It's scarce. There's a fixed total supply of 21 million uh, BTC of uh, total available supply by the time it's all been mined. It's divisible to uh, 100 millionths currently. Uh, that's way more divisible than gold. But uh, like gold, divisible. Like gold, fixed supply. We don't know the total amount of gold uh, in the world or in the universe. We have estimates of it. Uh, but we can't endlessly print gold. It's fungible, which means that the various units are completely interchangeable with each other. It doesn't matter whether you've got this kilo of gold or that kilo of gold, they're equivalent. Um, it's also recognizable. This is very important for a, a, uh, a, a commodity style currency. You have to not be able to uh, be hoodwinked and given false uh, versions of this, uh, this apparent gold. Uh, my uh, favorite story about this is that New York gold dealers uh, have been quite uh, publicly and recently hoodwinked by uh, criminals uh, coring the inside of gold bars and filling them with tungsten, which has many of the same me metallic properties, uh, but of course, which is a lot cheaper than gold. So uh, they, uh, they can fail to recognize true gold bars themselves, and the only way to find out is to, uh, to drill holes in them, and they did that and found that they didn't really have gold. Gold is also, just sort of powering through some of these, gold is also politically neutral. Uh, there, there you can, uh, I've got a little asterisk there to, uh, to just let me out of, uh, out of uh, being strictly correct on that. There is a certain politics to uh, a lot of these things. Uh, and I would say that in Bitcoin's case, um, it's fungible, recognizable, and politically neutral, but its neutrality is kind of radical. It's, it's, a, it's a radical neutrality, and that is, uh, in some people's eyes, part of its essential politics. So Bitcoin is way better than gold in many ways. Uh, it can be transmitted over the internet. It, uh, it's weightless. It's printable. We've mentioned that. What you actually print is, in fact, the keys, the control of your Bitcoin. The Bitcoin itself stays on the network in much the same way as your car might stay on the road, just parked, and you keep your keys in the pocket, in your pocket. Your car and everyone else's car is on the road, but your keys are with you and you keep them safe. Uh, that's a much better metaphor than coins, in my view, uh, of Bitcoin. And, uh, and that the uh, your car keys may not be printable, uh, but uh, Bitcoin keys certainly are, and they can be rendered in various ways. You might have seen the QR codes, and you can also uh, print them with, the, uh, uh, with an alphabet. You get those long cryptic strings. Uh, Bitcoin enables shared control. Two people, like a shared bank account, can have all kinds of shared control. Uh, they can equal, have equal shared control, just like a joint bank account. Uh, or they can have uh, sort of uh, the, the so-called multi-sig, the uh, multiple signatures are required. Say two out of uh, three possible signatures might be required. And so that lets you have quite sophisticated uh, ways of managing an account contents, if you want to think of it like an account. It's backup friendly. If I have my keys on a device and I back that device up, the keys will be backed up with it. Uh, I'm also capable of uh, giving uh, someone uh, a, the facility to receive Bitcoin, but not spend it at all. Uh, so if you sent a uh, little uh, Jack to the market with, to, to sell the cow, there's no danger that, uh, that the Jack will spend the, uh, the proceeds on magic beans on the way home. Uh, because uh, Jack doesn't have the ability to spend it just to receive the money and, and to verify uh, receipt of that money. Uh, Bitcoin's also memorizable. I think this is super cool. You can actually just memorize your Bitcoin. The value of that Bitcoin could be any amount. And uh, various schemes exist for, for uh, creating a memorizable uh, key, in fact, what you're memorizing. Uh, and one typical scheme is a uh, sequence of 12 English words. Uh, so, you know, fuse box, um, pop, uh, camera, you know, carpet, just a sequence of words, and 12 of those is enough to encode the data for that private key. You can travel across borders, 
you, you can be scanned by airport scanners and uh, you can go straight through that. You have to declare $10,000 worth of uh, bearer instruments or uh, traveler's checks or cash. Uh, there's really uh, th that question of are you carrying money is uh, starting to, to deteriorate and become uh, slightly meaningless. So uh, Bitcoin is evil apparently. Uh, yeah, there's a lot of divided opinion about uh, what Bitcoin uh, really means for the economy. I think I'll just skip through this. Uh, Bitcoin's a payment network. So on the 22nd of November last year, uh, my wedding anniversary, um, somebody, not me, moved $147 million worth equivalent of Bitcoin for free. And that was instantaneous. And um, that's the sort of thing that would make bankers who charge a percentage on such f services might make them feel a little uncomfortable and threatened. How can Bitcoin do that? We can talk about that if you have any specific questions. Uh, but what that means is Bitcoin is fantastic, and this is sort of an obvious use of the payment network for remittance to the third world. A couple of stats here. Uh, in Uganda, uh, remittances uh, make up $700 million. Uh, worth of uh, transmitted money, usually from uh, family members in rich countries. And uh, the fees are around 10 to 20 percent for that service. Uh, in Uganda, bank uh, accounts are generally less common than, say, a mobile phone, because they're more expensive. If you put $100 in a bank there, or shillings in a bank there, you will lose it. It will be gone uh, in fees or something. Uh, Globally, this uh, remittance market is in excess of 500 billion, and the average fee is 9%. So you can see that it varies depending on who the recipient is. And if anyone's ever seen uh, Andreas rail against this, you know that uh, the highest fees are reserved for the poorest countries, up to 40%. And um, I want you to just think about this. Uh, Western Union invented electronic fund transfer in the 60s, but that was the 1860s, okay? How long was that ago? And they've basically sat on that and done very little more than uh, provide that same service since that time. Uh, if you're interested in hearing about the story of uh, Ronald, uh, pictured here, uh, bitcoinfilm.org. Uh, it's actually a really interesting story of how uh, his family has uh, it's been sending him money uh, using Bitcoin and trying to uh, get around uh, companies like Western Union and their fees. So this is the most important slide in my talk, most important concept, most important Bitcoin 101 idea. And that is that Bitcoin is fully decentralized. And why? Because that means there's no single point of failure. This is the defining feature of Bitcoin as a digital money. And we're going to need to remember that because we're going to see a lot of competition or uh, I shouldn't say competition, I think you'll see uh, plenty of lookalikes uh, from banks and various other uh, financial, traditional financial institutions as they attempt to make themselves look like, in the exact same manner as CompuServe did against the internet, make them look like Bitcoin. Bitcoin without the stinky revolutionary smell, maybe. But it won't be Bitcoin because it won't be fully decentralized. And um, hopefully you've all seen Star Wars I'm about to wreck the movie uh, for you if you haven't seen it. Uh, but Darth Vader learns a very uh, uh, important lesson about uh, having single points of failure as his uh, Death Star was destroyed by the Rebel Alliance because he had a single point of failure in that design. But what, what Bitcoin really is, and this is, this is starting to uh, zoom out a little, is that it is a, not a, just a payment network, not just a digital currency that connects that um, that, that, that travels on that payment network, um, but it's decentralized consensus network. And money is one of those things that you can do if you have one of these things. So that leads me to the third point about Bitcoin, which is that it is a general purpose technology. I think this is a, a, something to remember as we see all the specifics. We see a constellation of individual uh, examples of the use of Bitcoin. We see remittance, we see retail sales, we see maybe uh, certain uh, non-monetary uh, ideas, and I'll come to that in a moment. And where did this technology come from? Obviously, you're not expected to read that, 
but there are barely nine pages in the original Satoshi paper uh, defining the idea behind Bitcoin. And it's a fairly complete description for um, maybe not quite a specification, but it's a, it's a fairly complete um, depiction of what's important in, in the creation of this network from code. Uh, it explains how to keep all of the uh, various uh, aspects of Bitcoin in alignment so that they mutually support each other. So anyone know what this is? The Genesis block, right. Uh, this is a little clue as to why Bitcoin was created uh, and what it, what it really looks like. This is the actual data of it. Uh, you can see on uh, the right side that there is some text embedded in it. Uh, you don't need to squint to read that, though, because uh, the, uh, the source of this is actually the front page of the Times. Uh, you can see that headline, Chancellor on the Brink of uh, Second Bailout for Banks. And you can see the date, January 3rd, 2009. Uh, th this is an important uh, mechanism used by many people uh, when they want to ensure for everyone uh, that, that there's proof that this uh, could not have existed. This data, this initial block of the blockchain, could not have existed before that date uh, because the headline had not wouldn't, wouldn't be known until that date. Uh, this is a piece of the software code uh, that makes up Bitcoin's um, core implementation, one of the, uh, one of the apps, if you like, uh, that makes Bitcoin function. It's C++ code. Uh, if you know how to read it and write it, you can see that there is no trade secret here. There is no uh, hidden uh, man behind the curtain. There is really a completely open book or open uh, source uh, um, invention. Uh, that means you don't need to trust whoever's telling you that Bitcoin does what it really does. There's, there's really no way to hide uh, some kind of nefarious capability in there. But Bitcoin is not just money. This general purpose technology has quite a long list of obvious or at least uh, potential applications that people are either working on already or that people can imagine in enough detail. The full list, as Andreas was mentioning before, is most likely to be much larger than we can imagine. Uh, it includes all of the uh, in-between parts of the, in, the, in the constellation, all of the, all of the uh, full spectrum of, uh, of inventions that you can make of it. So uh, I won't read all of these here, but proof of existence is an interesting one because it's quite uh, far from the finance world. In the patent system, you have a mechanism for, for uh, registering publication of some invention. And then that registration allows you to defend the fact that you invented this thing. The problem with it, as Elon Musk uh, in, uh, in SpaceX, uh, he's uh, one of the, um, he's a fantastic entrepreneur. If you know him from Tesla, the electric car company, uh, he also has a company, SpaceX, building uh, commercial spacecraft. They don't patent anything at SpaceX because that would just publish all their secrets to governments who are their main competitors. It's completely useless for them. Uh, they can't protect against those. Uh, so proof of existence through the blockchain enables you to pay a small amount, say one cent, to an address which is derived from a document that describes your amazing invention. You can turn that document into what amounts to a very large number. And that large number corresponds to a Bitcoin address, kind of like coordinates in a massive desert where there is buried treasure at various places. That's like uh, the blockchain's uh, address space for, uh, for people to have their balances, their uh, unspent transaction outputs. They can hold their Bitcoin in one of these locations. And the desert is so large that there's really no feasible way to systematically go and search for where those Bitcoins might be. It would take for the end of time. So uh, proof of existence is a way of burying a little coin at the location that, that corresponds uh, to your document. And so at any point in the future, without having ever revealed the contents of your, that document, you can uh, prove that you had that document at that point in time, uh, back in 2014, when you uh, uh, came up with the idea and wrote it up. Uh, no one can refute that. It's cryptographically, uh, uh, there's no way to, that we know of to, to fake that. 
And here's a quote from Al Gore, who of course invented the internet. Uh, and uh, here's what he thinks about some of the things that Bitcoin provides. If you take that large list I get, showed you before, what can we do with Bitcoin? Well, so many things, but there's a theme here, replacing the functions of government, the sorts of things that government and, and other forms of high authority have been the sole uh, re responsible or entrusted parties to, to look after. We can now create those just in software. And as a software developer, I have to admit I feel slightly ashamed that I didn't expect this. I didn't recognize it sooner, you know, that I didn't realize that this was possible. Uh, and now that I see it, I have sort of, you know, I've opened into a whole new world of, wow, what can we do with this sort of technology? It isn't just money that we can create. It's anything that we've had centralized trust, needed centralized trust for in the past, which is suitable for a decentralized trust network. So I wanted to leave some time for questions. Uh, hopefully I've seeded some. And uh, people, this, discovering Bitcoin is, uh, is an endless sequence of questions for me. And, uh, and fi finding the answers is uh, part of the appeal. So if anyone has any, I'd be welcoming them now. Um, so I've got a question around the elevator pitch for Bitcoin. Hmm. We, we at, um, at, at Cryptex, one of the big things that we sort of feel is when we approach someone who knows absolutely nothing about Bitcoin and we have to give them that 30 second to a minute speech explaining to them what it actually is, normally their eyes go glazed over and they look at us and go, uh, I don't understand what the hell you're talking about, mm. especially when you start talking about all these different facets of Bitcoin. Yeah. Do you have a good answer for that for, in terms of the uh, I have a good answer for you. I'm not sure whether it's the answer you want. Uh, first of all, it, um, it depends on who's asking. So uh, one of the problems, we in a privileged uh, position in a sort of first world economy with a fantastic currency, uh, we are really not, we're perfectly suited to misunderstand the opportunity here because we have this privilege that gives us so many things that Bitcoin offers to the rest of the world. The, uh, the other six billion. Uh, this is something that um, other people never ask about. Uh, people who are desperately in need of a solution to problems recognize it in Bitcoin as they recognize it in all sorts of other crazy schemes to avoid their uh, oppressive uh, governments or their uh, corrupt uh, financial management or their uh, inflated currencies. And the other answer is that, uh, so while it does depend on who, who's asking, you need to sort of pitch it to them, uh, someone in the first world, you don't say, well, because it's easier payments, because it's not really, it's not really that good at easier payments. I mean, in Australia, I'm sh I haven't quite seen it here, I'm not sure if it's my credit card, but we just have this sort of tap and go NFC, you, you wave your credit card over the, uh, over the little, little box and, and bam, if it's under a threshold, then you don't need to enter any uh, other credentials, it just happens. I mean, how much better can it really be? I mean, how much more convenient? I guess you wouldn't have to extend your arm. You could have some other technology to do that for you. It's not going to get much better than that. It's an intention to pay that's virtually uh, no, uh, no bother. So I don't see uh, Bitcoin as being an improved uh, mechanism for retail shoppers to uh, you know, buy new stuff they don't need. I see it as being, um, I think, you know, here's another answer. Just give them some Bitcoin. That's the one that seems to work best, I think. Just give them a bit of Bitcoin. And uh, that really says a lot more than all those long words. Thank you. Well, uh, this might be going beyond Bitcoin 101, but what are your thoughts on the different Bitcoin 2.0 protocols, like say mm. Ethereum, Counterparty, Ripple, and so forth? Yeah, uh, I just, I, I don't get too involved in all of them because there are too many and there are too many exciting things to follow up on and I have a day job as well, which I have to do. So um, I, I like a lot, of, a lot of them. I just go on this sort of the smell, I, I, you know, technically and I think a lot of it will come down to what can that team do? How much value can that team uh, push out and in a sort of reliable way? It's just the same as Twitter or any other sort of technology company releasing a stream of features that, that, that add value together. That's where the value of these things comes from. It's not because they've created X units and so therefore those X units are going to just increase in value just because they're scarce 
or because they have, say, the same feature set as Bitcoin. Bitcoin's in this sort of first mover position, so now that it's there, you're going to have to do something a lot better than whatever Bitcoin comes up with in that same time frame if you want to distinguish yourself as having something in addition. I do see a world where we'll have multiple currencies. Uh, we'll also have things that we really can't call currencies. Uh, they all um, fit somewhere on the spectrum of all of those instruments. Uh, I do like uh, the, the look and the, the sort of, I call it the smell of the sort of Ethereum project. Uh, I have bought a little bit of that. I, um, originally, I kind of quite liked Master Party, although Master, not Master Party, Master Coin. Um, um, mixing my, uh, my 2.0s up there. Uh, Master Coin, but I think uh, Counterparty is probably a better version of that sort of effort. And there are many other, I mean, Namecoin I like really quite a lot in principle. And, uh, and I'd love to talk to anyone later if they want to discuss identity systems based on blockchain technology. But there's lots that I like that I haven't mentioned. Like, Thank you. So a quick question. Um, since you're doing Bitcoin 101, how is it going, like, just convincing your friends and family to get on board? Has it been easier this year with the price going down, but higher acceptance? Just how is that trend going for you? Uh, I think the, uh, the, when the price goes up, uh, the media sells Bitcoin because they, they keep on telling these crazy, um, w these whitewash histories of, oh, and then Bitcoin took off and it was fantastic and people got rich overnight. And uh, that's a lot of people who are getting into bi buying Bitcoin and holding it, that's why they're doing it. And that's not why I do it. I mean, I'm, I'm not going to miss an opportunity to, to buy a little bit in case it does go up by these huge magnitudes. Uh, but that really convinces a lot of people. But I think many of us are used to being uh, the Bitcoin guy, the Bitcoin girl, who the, all their friends and family are like, he's not going to start talking about Bitcoin again right now, he's at the table. That's me, I'm that guy uh, where I work and everyone knows it. I have noticed though, people are starting to sort of, so you know that Bitcoin thing, and they ask me, and I try, you've got to not wear them out, but uh, yeah, how do you convince them? I don't know that convincing them is necessarily the primary objective. But, uh, but, it, but since you asked, I think you have to sort of you know, keep that balance right. But, but knowing where they're coming from and what they like and what they're in, interested in, whether it's music or something, that can, be a, uh, that can be an avenue for pitching it, if you like. What's your take on the factors that determine the price of Bitcoin? So the question was, what's my take on the factors that determine the price of Bitcoin? I think the slide we've seen uh, is really interesting because it's happened through a sequence of what can only be described as fantastically good news. There's been, an, since, you know, the, for the last two quarters, there's been this sequence of great news and the price is sliding down. I think a lot of that is the fact that people are really not understanding the fundamentals of the technology. That's not why they're in it. They are investing or they're trading, and a lot of margin trading as well. There's, there's been these, um, uh, yeah, so, I know some traders and uh, talk to them. I'm not a trader, but uh, they've been telling me about the margin hunters. A lot of optimism in the market, which is what we have probably in this room, people buy Bitcoin and they use some of the services to, ma to, to do margin uh, trading, which means that they stand to increase their uh, value a lot um, if the price goes up a little. However, they can't stand for it to go down very much. That's the trade-off in that margin, that uh, going long on Bitcoin. And a lot of professional traders are entering this space. They know this, this is like easy for them. They go, watch this, we'll put 100 grand in, we're gonna um, push the price down, it's gonna bust through all the margin calls of these optimistic uh, you know, newbie traders. They're all gonna auto sell, it's gonna push the price down even more and then we're gonna pick it up down here. This is uh, gonna turn into a very sophisticated trading game. So uh, if you're not ready for that, like I'm not, I'm not gonna go in and do that, I'll lose everything. So, but I think that has an effect on the price too. It's a very small liquidity pool. It can be pushed around easily. Okay, thanks. That's all the time we have.